Hi. Hello. Uh, welcome to Dining with the Diva. This week has been so crazy hot that I thought um, I'd do food without cooking. So one of the things that um, all Tuscan meals begin with usually, are little uh, crostini. So crostini are like little pieces of bread topped with things. Um, we uh, traditionally have chicken liver crostini. Hi, Bill. How are you? Welcome. Uh, we're just waiting for a storm to come in right now. So we're blowing away with wind, but we haven't gotten any rain right now. So today we're doing all non-cooking recipes. Uh, little crostini, which to me are a party anyway, if you have um, all this bread. So I just took like a little baguette and cut them on an angle. Ciao. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, it's the world's smallest kitchen. Hi, Robin. You're always here. I love you. Um, we're going to make all these little crostini, which is um, perfect for a party. And not using um, the the, uh, the stove, we're going to do uh, things all with my little blender, okay? My brawn immersion blender. So did you guys um, all go by? And uh, on the Dining with the Diva uh, page, I wrote out... Um, the recipes for you already, okay? And so I thought that might be kind of fun to, you could actually see and kind of cook along or whatever. So we're gonna do three different sauces. And in my cookbook, I don't know if I have it here today. Um, the Florentines have a thing called Vitello Tornato. And they, Ciao Gianfranca, oh Montreal, beautiful. And uh, salsa tonato is traditionally done with like a poached, they take like a veal roast, a nice big veal roast, and they poach it. And then they let it chill and they slice it paper thin and they would cover a nice big serving tray with it. And then they cover it with this tone sauce, which is kind of like a, a tuna mayonnaise. And um, then top it with capers, put it back in the refrigerator, chill it, and then serve it as a cold main course. Now the other day I went out to a place in Siena when I had my week-long program, and they did a beautiful uh, tone. And what they did were paper-thin slices of roast beef just fanned on the plate. The tone sauce was just served so you could take as much or as little as you like. And then there was a little um, a tomato peel rose, which was really pretty. So it was very simple, very elegant presentation. I love tuna salad. I love tuna. And when you're in Italy, you kind of get tuna often like this. Nice big, I'll show this to you, tuna fillets. Hi Kelly. Tuna fillets, big chunks of tuna packed in oil. And sometimes you can actually go to a shop and uh, they'll have a big giant can of tuna like this, huge. And they'll just take out a fillet for you, which is the most beautiful uh, tuna, which I really like. So instead of using mayonnaise, because I don't like egg-based things if you're going to be serving them raw, you know, in the summer sitting outside, yeah, raw eggs can go bad. Um, I'll sit, give you guys a link on the Dining with the Diva page. There's a beautiful milk mayo, which came from Spain, which David Leet writes about on his, um, his beautiful website. And I've made it, and it is exquisite. And it's uh, milk, lemon juice, uh, and oil with a pinch of salt, I think. You, they put garlic in, but we really don't like so much heavy raw garlic, so I don't put it in. But I've done the anchovy version. He has the tomato version. Um, I'll give you the link when you go on the website. But instead, what is, um, what is mayonnaise? It's a raw egg. It's something to stabilize it. Like usually French put in a little dried mustard powder, or you can add and lemon juice, a little acid, and salt, and then you puree it. And so I normally, in uh, something like a jar like this, would just put all the ingredients and uh, put the immersion blender down, go ee, 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 and pull it up, and it's ready in two seconds to have a fresh mayonnaise. So I'm going to start by making the tonne sauce, okay? And so what I've done is, in, in a glass jar like this, which is very simple to do. Oh, yeah, Kelly, is it already raining where you are? We just have wind. Uh, we're all waiting for this huge storm. It's been flooding northern Italy. I put 100 grams of tuna in this uh, in this jar. I'm just going to break it up a little bit to make it easier. And uh, don't worry, I'm going to add anchovies just to make it a little, give it a little more personality. I love anchovies. 
I never did in America, but um, the other day I went and I made, I bought at the store, use my chopsticks, which are my other fingers, and I bought salt-packed anchovies, and then I soak them in uh, vinegar, and then I take the salt and I take the bones out, and I make these um, beautiful, beautiful little anchovies, which I pack in oil. So I'm just going to put two in there. You don't have to, but it's another nice flavor. Okay? Just put this down. Okay. I, I make about um, six ounces at a time. I buy, buy these salt-packed anchovies, soak them, peel them, and then put them in the... I have this special little... Uh, it's probably a butter dish. Uh, this is where I keep all my, my anchovy things. Or pit grilled and marinated pumpkin. I have a couple of those little jars like that. Okay, so we've got the tuna. We have anchovies. I have um, vinegar packed capers. Okay, so about a tablespoon of those. That's going to give a nice tang, like lemon juice would. Um, so you can have lemon juice or a little bit of the vinegar, which is just light. Okay, and then a cup of light oil. Now for something like this, um, I like sunflower seed oil. I don't usually use olive oil. I think it gets to be kind of heavy. So I'm going to keep something a little bit lighter. So I'm going to get the, the oil ready, like that. And I'm going to start. Do you guys know what an immersion blender is? This? Okay. This is an immersion blender. And it comes in, uh, it'll break down into two pieces. I really like this brawn. It's very powerful. It has uh, two buttons for power, but it also has speeds on the top. So I get a good emulsion with this. So I'm just going to start. Let me get my oil out of the way so I don't dump it. By pureeing all this first, okay? This is how I make soup. I just cook everything first in the, in the pot. And then I puree at this, instead of where everyone used to take it all out and put it in a blender, you just put this right in your pot and it saves you a lot of time. So this is pureeing all this, breaking everything down. Okay, and then I'm going to add the oil, yeah, a little bit. This is going to just start it kind of a little. refreshing in the summer and um, to let this sit for a minute I'm going to rinse this off because I'm going to need it again let me just see I think I might add a little more tuna to this today because I want it to be a little thicker I want to show you my I do a thing that I made last year, which is really good, and I put it on tomato slices. So instead of beef, roast beef or roast veal, I do it on the tomatoes, which is really nice. I want this to be a little thicker, like a tuna salad. My hands are all greasy and wet right now. Okay, I'm just going to add another little piece here. So I just keep this in the refrigerator, and look at these beautiful fillets of tuna. Can you see those? They're really yummy. I'm just going to break this up in here. Whenever I'm in doubt, I always have a tuna sandwich at a bar when I go out. It's a nice big fillets of tuna, usually with sliced tomatoes. And so this, um, I, can, I could fill um, deviled eggs with this, too. It's really nice. I put it inside a 
little cherry tomatoes and chill those as a little appetizer. It's really good too for summer. That's why I thought about my tomatoes tonne. Let's do this again. Is it hot where you guys are too? I am dying. This last week I had the, the my kitchens of county. It was record brain heat. We've been having a drought. It's so humid. Okay, I'm gonna let that set up a little bit in the refrigerator now. Okay, yeah, I'll give it a little more body. Like I said, too, it's so hot here right now. I always think these things better too the next day. Be careful when you do this, be sure it's unplugged. I saw the other day my girlfriend uh, ended up in the hospital because it, she accidentally turned it on while her finger was doing this. Not a good idea. Be careful. These blades are really, really um, sharp. Okay, let me put that in the refrigerator. So this is my tone sauce, sauce number one. So usually, like I said, you would spread this on the veal and then top it with capers. You can decorate the side of the plate with lemon slices. It ends up being a really, really classic summer, summer dish. It's really fun. You remember Silver Palette Cookbook? Once I saw that they um, they baked it in a tuna sauce. That wasn't the idea. Okay. So this is the, the little tuna puree thing. Okay. Be right back. Put that in the refrigerator. And let me rinse this out. Then I'll show you my other tool, which is kind of fun. I like when you don't have to use 75 different things to make recipes, okay? Okay, so uh, number two, when um, I go to Sicily and we take cooking classes in Sicily, um, one of the recipes that's real traditional there is the pesto trapanese. So trapani is on the west coast and they have, in Sicily, they have more almonds than they do pine nuts, okay? So I um, roasted the pine nuts, I mean the, the almonds a little bit. I toasted them in the skillet. I like them to be, um, I think it gives them more flavor. Now traditionally what they do is that you can use almonds and pine nuts, add your basil, like you normally would do to make pesto, parmesan cheese and olive oil. And then what they do for a pasta sauce is that they take cherry tomatoes and throw it in. Now this could start fights everywhere. Um, I've seen it everywhere from red, a red sauce with a uh, pesto in it, or I've seen a green pesto with just cherry tomatoes in it. So I was inspired by this recipe because I have a, um, there's an appetizer I buy there. I buy sun-dried cherry tomatoes, which are marinated, and then um, they have pistachios in them, which are really nice. And so I do a, um, a sun-dried tomato pesto because I love it as a spread, especially on bread, okay? So what I'm gonna do for that one now, uh, and I will add garlic to that, okay? So we're gonna do the pesto rosso from Trapani. So I'm gonna, you could do it in, um, this also is another little food processor. Hi, Amy. How nice. Hi, Char Charlene, hi. This is a little food processor that comes with this too, which is really easy to use and really fun, okay? So for my pesto, I'm gonna take the, the olives, and if you want, you can add a few pine nuts. Pine nuts are very expensive. If you've seen what it takes to harvest pine nuts, you'll get it, okay? They could be up to like 70 euros a kilo or something, like pistachios, I'll add a few. And you can also toast those if you wanted to. So we have the um, 
the almonds and that, and then a few, a little bit of basil. Now my basil in uh, in uh, Tuscany, it's so strong. Hi Vivian, hi. Your television, oh isn't that amazing? I'm on TV with Vivian, how great. The basil here is so strong, you have to be really careful. The first time I made pesto, and I threw up. It, it just totally gagged me. The olive oil here is really strong, the basil is really strong. So you really, it's all about the ingredients and you have to, to just do something to taste. So I can't tell you to add like, you know, a cup of, uh, of basil leaves. I'm just going to add a few because these are, are so strong. So I'm going to start and make a, um, a little basil pesto base. So you don't want the stems, just the leaves. Oh, can I tell you another trick to keep your pesto really green that I learned at a Michelin star restaurant? Put little shards of ice in. When you're working with a blender, it tends to heat up. Knives, if you chop pesto, you know, a pesto is made with a mortar and pestle. And you're supposed to pesta it, is to crush. And that keeps it a really electric green. If you're using um, a blender, add some ice cubes, okay? So we're gonna add the, um, the nuts, little Parmesan cheese that I already grated. Okay, and I'll just put this on here and start. Look how cute this is. It works so well. Okay, ready? It's going to be a little noisy. Okay, that's our nut base. Look at this. I think this would be great with breadcrumbs. Look at that. Oh my God, it smells so good. Roberto. Oh my God, the king of pesto is here. Roberto, how are you? Did you guys see on uh, the news? Roberto Panizza is from Genoa. He makes the best pesto in the whole world. I met him when he was here at a food show in Florence. He has a pesto. Roberto, quanto peso tu mortaio? He has a mortaio to make his pesto by hand. I can't even imagine what it weighs. I just asked him, we'll see if he answers. But there's a new law where you can take pesto on the airplane with you. And of course, he thought about this before the law came out. He has a stand in the airport, in Genoa, I'm sure, with his pesto, and they made it a law night, you could take pesto. 42 kilos, like, 80, like 85 pounds. It's 2.2 pounds to a kilo, so 42 kilos, 84, 86, 88. 88 pounds, and he, he travels with this huge mortaio, and he makes this beautiful pesto by hand. So if you go to Genoa, Roberto Panizza, look him up on Facebook. He's got a great little site there. You always see all the events he belongs in. So this is from Sicily, not from Genoa, okay? And um, so I've got my base there, and I'm going to add, uh, I have a lighter extra virgin olive oil, okay? So I'm going to start adding some oil. Okay, and then the thing that makes this Sicilian are the sun-dried tomatoes, okay? Like I said, they use fresh tomatoes. 4,000, oh my God, the pesto is uh, 5 kilos, which is about 12 pounds. So I'm going to add some sun-dried tomatoes in here. When they make theirs, it's those small cherry tomatoes. Okay, in the fresh cherry tomatoes in the... Um, in the pesto. So this is my sun-dried tomatoes. So the sun-dried tomatoes are tomatoes dried in the sun and then they're um, kind of rehydrated and packed in oil. So they're not not really tough, okay? So I'm going to add these. I like it to be really tomatoey. Okay, so here we go. Let me see what I was saying. Oh no, Roberto, it's nice for you to come in. Thank you very much. People like to know this. Everyone, you know, makes their own versions, and I think it's important when people maintain the tradition, and there's a reason why people do that. So I'm just going to pulse now, so excuse me. So I'm going to be having the moisture here of the sun-dried tomatoes. Charlene, yeah. Do you know Roberto Charlene? Look him up on um, 
on Facebook <laughs> and visit him in uh, in general. He also has a restaurant. Okay, I'm going to add a little more olive oil because I want this to be kind of spreadable. I'm making it to spread on bread. So if you made it uh, the way that they do it, they would do traditionally um, a pesto with a uh, with almonds instead of just pine nuts. Oh, I forgot to put garlic in. With a little bit of garlic, because my husband doesn't really like a lot of garlic. So I tend to uh, not put the garlic in very often. Let me just add some garlic. Um, so it's garlic and pine nuts, basil, oil, Parmesan cheese. There's like laws how things are supposed to be made traditionally. And then if you change something, I really wish you would change what you call it, you know? I like to say often, you know, I'm inspired by or, you know, something like that. So you, um, people know that's what they're not going to, they're not going to find it when you go to, um, to Italy. I've heard so many people, it's so funny, say that Italian food is better like in Texas or in America or something because... They come here and what they've had growing up as Italian American food or whatever. People change things when they got to America because the ingredients were different. So So look at this, how beautiful and rustic this is. This is a really beautiful nutty paste. Okay, I'm going to taste it to see if I like it. Mmm, this is so good. Mm. So I would just do this. And spread it on bread. Okay? So that's a sun-dried tomato pesto. And like I said, you know, you could toast the almonds, you can leave them plain, whatever you like. And then um, our last sauce is going to be the, um, the salsa di noce. So this is also, they use it in Genoa, and they might make it a little differently. Everywhere you go, they make it differently. I've also done a Turkish cuisine, and there's a walnut sauce with the... Um, Circassian chicken, so you do a, a bed of rice, you poach chicken breasts, and you can shred the chicken and put on the rice, and then they do a similar to what we're going to be making, a walnut sauce and put it on top, and then they heat paprika and olive oil and drizzle that on top for spice, and then they add pomegranate seeds for a little acidity and contrast, okay? So Roberto, uh, come si fa la salsa di noce a Genoa? Um, there's a lot of pastas that do the salsa di noce, which is really nice. And uh, in general, too, they have a dialect. Um, where else do I have walnuts? Oh, Mexican food. The uh, chili and nogales. They do a beautiful green chili that's stuffed with the ground meat with raisins and pine nuts, kind of a Spanish influence. I'm trying to think. I think then they batter fry it. That's chili de enos. They, there's another one where they fill it with, I think, the meat, and then they toss... Top, top it with a walnut sauce and pomegranate seeds too. So you kind of see the Spanish influence when it moves around. Nuts, olive oil, marjoram. Yeah, marjoram is really good. Thank you, Roberto. So for this one, do you, do you put bread in it or just nuts? Um, this um, Tuscan version of the walnut sauce, kind of like you would make um, meatballs or something. I just took a soft baguette and uh, broke it up and soaked it in milk so it's soft. Yeah, oh, niente pana, molica di pana. Yeah, no cream. So I have my bread soaked in milk. That's going to be my base. Let me just make sure. Okay. Margins are a really good idea. Uh oh. Oh, my lights are going to go out. <gasps> oh, the storm. Okay. And then you have walnuts. Now, if you get really wild and crazy, you can actually um, peel your walnuts, okay? I toasted mine today. Do you know how to peel a walnut? You actually drop it in boiling water for a minute, and then you take it out, and you sit there anal retentively and peel it. But sometimes walnuts can have a bitter flavor. These were very light and delicate walnuts, so I don't think they're going to have a problem, okay? So this, I'm going to also add a little salt to it. 
And if you guys have any marjoram, that's really, really a nice touch. Okay, so we have the bread crusts. And then um, we'll put also a little bit of garlic in there. Not a lot. I really don't like garlic anymore. Um, I think it can be overpowering. Maybe it's, you know, it's just here, but um, I just got used to not eating it. And I think so many people in America really love to add a ton of garlic. And I think it's overpowering. But we're also we're saying that I'm just going to put like three little slices in, okay? Um... Italian cooking is all about simplicity and the quality of ingredients and kind of less is more and so if you're like tomatoes are really good all they really need is like salt and olive oil we don't need anything on them besides that okay so I add a little bit of salt and we'll um, see about start pureeing <laughs> down in there. I think for the Turkish one, it's actually eventually thin with a little bit of broth that you poach the chicken. Now this, because it has the bread in it, because it has the nuts in it, it tends to thicken up too. So uh, if it thickens up, you can thin it a little bit. A little more belt, water, oil. Okay, I'm going to add olive oil. Let's say that's one, two, three tablespoons. Okay. So you can see how quick these are with this little um, blender thing. I'm going to turn it up. serving this with pasta too I would take some of the pasta water and I would, the walnut sauce doesn't get cooked and I would put it in the saucepan where I'm going to then toss the pasta when it comes out from being drained add a little of that hot pasta water put the pasta in there thin it and just toss it together and just warm it it doesn't need to be cooked I usually put this on my um, ravioli nudi I really like that almost there I'm going to taste this. Let me see if it needs more salt. Mmm. Oh my God. I love this. I'm going to add a little more milk. Give me some milk. Since I'm not making any uh, pasta water today, this is just going to go on bread. Hi, Louis. Hi, Maria. Grazie. Okay, so we have the walnut sauce. That's perfect now. Okay, perfect. Watch your fingers. Remember, turn it off, unplug it. Don't stick your fingers in there when the motor can be turned on. Avoid any problems. So this is just really such a great recipe with such a great history. And you'll see it in so many different places. It really is lovely on, on like chicken or turkey. Let me just put this into a bowl. So you can see how nice and thick it gets and why you would need to probably thin it if you're going to be serving it on the pasta. I really liked the Genovese version with marjoram. I think it's really a good idea. Okay. So, here we have the beautiful, um, oops, uh, walnut sauce. And you can see it's nice and thick. And so, this could be just spread on bread. I think a nice, uh, something green would be pretty on here. Because white on white can be so boring. Um, I love fresh herbs. I have some chives. I have thyme. So you see, this is really just lovely on bread. I've done it sometimes too where I've left the walnuts kind of nice and chunky. 
like I did on the pesto sauce, the red pesto. I've also got another, I love toppings, so I have another recipe I do. Um, no, the bread's not toasted. Um, for putting them on sliced, you could. I like, I like soft bread. Um, our bread is unsalted, remember? So it can be kind of yucky, so I'm just using un untoasted baguettes. But um, it's nice sometimes if you alternate them. So, um, you know, these are nice and soft. They're easy to bite for a party. I don't want something that someone's going to have to fight with when it's finger food. Um, so this is a crostino when it's this small. And if I had a whole slice of bread like off of French bread, that's a crostoni. So a crostoni, you would bake in the oven with toppings. It could be artichoke hearts, olives, uh, chunks of mortadella, um, Parmesan cheese. Uh, mixed in with things, chunks of mozzarella, oregano, olive oil, and you bake them so it's like a pizza bread, just toppings just break down there, and then you cut them into slices and you share them. In Florence, we have a little restaurant called, um, we have two. One's a wine bar called uh, Volpe Luva that I really love. When you go over the Ponte Vecchio, not the first street, but keep going up straight via Guicciardini and turn left into that first piazza and go under the archway. On the left is... Um, Volpe Luva. It's my favorite wine bar. You get beautiful wines by the glass. And then they do these long, narrow crostoni, which are, they have big loaves of bread, but they manage to cut them so they're not really wide. You know, they cut them on an angle, so it's really beautiful. And, um, oh, they have really creative toppings on theirs. And then they cut them and you share them. So you can order several different sandwiches there, these little crostoni that's so fabulous. So anyway, so we have, back to business. We have our our red pesto, which I remember you could, um, you could also turn the almonds almost to an almond butter paste. Um, so these are sun-dried tomatoes, almonds, and a little bit of basil. Then we have, I got our tone sauce out now, which is, you know, like an Italian um, non-mayonnaise tuna, um, which we did with capers and oil. Okay, so the pesto, let me go get the, the tuna sauce. So I also wanted to show you, I just got the Chino Cinque Cinque. No, Cinque Cinque is in, um, is in uh, the Piazza della Pastora, uh, which is to the right. When you go down uh, uh, the Ponte Vecchio, you would uh, turn left to go to Vini Vecchi Sapori. Ciao, Brigida. So I'm going to make my tomatoes tonata. So see, here's my little tomato sauce, which then I could spread on these, on my tomatoes. And if you wanted to, you could use mayonnaise. Mayonnaise makes everything a little whiter and maybe a little prettier instead of a blah, blah color like brown. And then to make it nice, I could just put a couple of a caper on each one in the middle. Okay. So these are my tomatoes tonati, pomodori tonati. So that's like a little tuna salad on your tomatoes. Ti piace pomodori tonati, Brigida? Ciao, Filippo. So this is a fun, just a summer thing. I could put that on bread and make it like a you know tuna salad sandwich, which would be really nice. So then we did the um, the Tuscan version of a walnut sauce, nice and thick, which should be for pasta. I would thin that. And remember, um, I showed you once how to make the ravioli nudi. That's really beautiful with this. Uh, so we have our. Let me just finish this up. That was there, the tomato sauce. We just need to do some bread with that. So yeah, tuna is my summer go-to kind of thing. So we have our little tuna crostini. Traditionally, uh, they do chicken liver crostini in Florence. That's in my cookbook. And um, but it's kind of a you know a wintry kind of thing in that it's uh, chicken livers. Not everybody likes those, and those usually serve warm. So people love parties party food. So here I have my three crostini. Ciao Angela. So we have a sun-dried tomato pesto, my version from Trapani. Uh, I use pomodori secchi and the basil and the um, almonds and a few pine nuts. And then we have the uh, the, tone the 
walnut sauce, which is Tuscan, but also from Genoa. The ravioli noodles with the walnut sauce, yeah, they're really good. And then we have the uh, the tone. So to do the, the do the walnut sauce as uh, pasta, you don't cook it. So I would put this like in the bottom of my skillet, thin it with some of the hot pasta water. So as I'm approaching the, the nudie, I would have a skillet ready, not on the heat, just there. And I would uh, put a few tablespoons of the walnut sauce in the bottom, take some of the boiling water from the pasta cooking, and thin this until it looks like a cream sauce. You know, it's, it's cream. And then you can um, uh, put the nudie in there and just, just warm it to serve it. And then it's beautiful. It's a nice complement together. Okay? So that's all today. I just thought it would be some fast, quick, non-cooking recipes. Well, now we're waiting for a storm to come in instead of uh, dying in the heat. So if you guys have any ideas what I should make next week, let me know. I'm leaving on uh, July 6th. I'm going to go to the Oxford Food Symposium. And um, the symposium this year, uh, the subject is like landscape, the landscape of food, how food relates to where it comes from. And at the end of July, I hope to be going down to Sarno, which is uh, where San Marzano tomatoes come from. So if you guys follow the scandal, like the New York Times, about the San Marzano tomatoes, it's... Um, there's a reason certain things are grown in certain areas. Now, you could take those seeds and plant them anywhere, and yeah, it's from a San Marzano seed, but there's nothing like having something where it's grown originally from and in the soil. Uh, Sarno is in a volcanic valley uh, under the Vesuvius um, volcano in Naples. So their soil is really rich, and my friend's dad, uh, started a cooperative, and I swear to God, I think all the people that work there are like 70 years old. They have these little houses on our, 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 a beautiful river that goes through the Sarno Valley, and um, so they have this beautiful fresh spring water, and little shrimp, I mean that's how clean the water is, little special shrimp grow, you know, live there. And at uh, they started last year, and I was invited down by Paolo Ruggiero to San Marzano Day to um, point out why and how this region is so different to be educated about San Marzano tomatoes. So you can get, uh, you know, DOP is a denomination of origin protected. So technically, you can't call a tomato San Marzano unless it's from San Marzano. Like champagne is only from Champagne. So there's a terroir that makes an ingredient what it is. You know, a, it's a plum tomato. It just changes where it is. But until you've had one of these tomatoes, when you smell a tomato sauce from one of these tomatoes, it is insane. It's really, 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 really good. So they cost a little bit of more. And my friend um, Beatrice Gustiamo Tomato, uh, Gustiamo in New York in the Bronx, she has a website. She brings them in, and I'm sure other people do too. Just uh, San Marzano, and look for San Marzano D dot O dot P dot. And I don't know, maybe it's five dollars a can, maybe it's eight dollars a can, but you should try them once in your lifetime. Because, um, again, when I talk about the quality of ingredients and the simplicity, when you're going out to eat and you spend so much money to go out to eat, hopefully it's because they're buying the best ingredients. So I'd rather stay home and not get the 200% markup on a bottle of wine, buy a great wine, buy great ingredients, cook at home, cook for my friends, can dress any way we want to and have a great meal, but with the best ingredients. So that's where I spend my money, you know. I love going out, too, to fancy restaurants every once in a while. Hi, Deborah. Oh, thanks. Yeah, it's kind of fun. I just, um, I'm trying, you know, mostly Tuscan, and I try to do recipes from where I've been and, uh, you know, tasted and stuff like that. Um, and sometimes I play with it like no one in Italy does a tomato tonato. But for me, there's nothing better than tomato salads, tomato sandwiches, tomato, tomato, tomato. I love tuna salads. Uh, we would take um, nice big salads, and they put chunks of tomatoes and just chunks of tuna in a salad. When you come here for summer now, they're making these big, beautiful salads uh, as a one-course meal, and they're really incredible. So tuna, get tuna. The tuna here is incredible. And they might even add, like, little baby mozzarella cheese, some capers, some black olives, nice lettuces, maybe arugula, and these big bowls. They're just fabulous. I really love them. And tuna sandwiches, like, I'm fo my mouth's watering. I like a focaccia. You know, the, the nice, soft flatbreads are really, really good. Um, and then if you go out at nighttime too, you might find these little crostini as part of a happy hour. 
little paste. Now you could toast the breads and have just baskets of um, toasted bread, some toasted, some not toasted. And then you can have all your toppings and sauces and people can just make their own. Because you know sometimes when they, you know, if people have been sitting around for a while, it's not as nice. You know, if it's a small party at your house, but it's nice to just let people also, you know, the storm was come, come in, you guys. Oh my God. We have uh, cypress trees in front of our house and they're like doing this. They're crazy. Someone just said in Pisa it was storming and, you know, tiles are flying off the roof. So it's almost like a little tornado kind of thing. My back, I have my little backyard kitchen patio is right here. Things are starting to, to fly around there. <laughs> okay, well, thank you guys for stopping by. Remember, um, the recipes from today, I put them as a PDF on our Dining with the Diva uh, Facebook page. So if you're following me on Facebook, um, I'll go leave again the, uh, the link to if you want to join that. And if you have any questions, ask me on the Dining with the Diva page. And I'll be putting this on my YouTube channel. Please uh, help me grow and get uh, more people following me on the YouTube channel. And um, we'll keep cooking, okay? Ciao for now. Bye-bye.